bench, she served as the administrator of OIRA. Before OIRA, she taught for 11 years at the Antonin Scalia Law School. In 2014, she founded the Center for the Study of the Administrative State. Uh, from 20, 2005 to 2006, she served as Special Assistant and Associate White House Counsel to President George W. Bush. George, Judge Rao clerked for Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit and Justice Clarence Thomas in the Supreme Court. She is a graduate of Yale and her law degree is from the University of Chicago Law School. Um, I have to confess that we recently did a prep call uh, with this group uh, for this session and I don't want to oversell it. Uh, but between the contrasting views of these uh, former com commissioners and Judge Rao's uh, commanding understanding of the law, I think we are in for a real treat. So please join me in welcoming Judge Rao and our panel. Nate, thanks so much for that kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be back here at this conference. Um, Hard to believe it's the 11th one. I, I think I have been at every single one of these conferences and it is great to be back. Um, I, you know, and also with events in recent years, there's a lot more of the executive branch to review. So, you know, it gives us, uh, it gives us a lot of things to talk about. Um, and, you know, one of the things that has perhaps most been in the news is the Federal Trade Commission. Um, there's been the recent uh, noisy exit of Commissioner Wilson. There's been discussion about the FTC's rulemaking authorities. There is a lot of pending litigation, which of course I will, will not speak to. Um, but there's a lot going on with this particular agency. And I can think of two no better people to talk about this issue with. Um, I, their full bios are in the material, so I'll just give them a, you know, just tell you a little bit about who we have. We have John Leibowitz, who um, he was a commissioner at the FTC from, uh, from 2004 to 2009. He was then elevated to be the chairman of the FTC, where he served until 20, uh, 2013. And he also served as a partner at Davis Polk for many years. And we have Noah Phillips, who was also a commissioner of the FTC. He served from 2018 to 2022. Prior to that, he was chief counsel to Senator Cornyn, and he is currently a partner at Cravath. So, um, so I think we have a lot of things to talk about, so, so we can jump right in. So, um, so we have, today we're at the Executive Branch Review Conference, and so I guess my first question, I hope this is not controversial, is do we all agree that the FTC is a part of the Executive Branch? <laughs> So, I, I'm happy to, to take the first answer, but let me just begin um, by thanking Nate uh, and the whole team at the Federalist Society for the kind invitation to be here. It's such an honor to be here with all of you, um, and in particular with John and Judge Rao. Um, I'm privileged to know both of them um, and their tremendous public servants and human beings. The answer is yes, it's part of the executive branch, but I should add, that I have sitting on the mantle above my desk um, a portrait of former Commissioner Humphrey. And, and can, I, can I interject for one second, if I may? In the middle of my Humphrey story? In a complimentary way, because you know, I don't think of ourselves cannot. as contrasting, as in contrast, I think of ourselves as compliment, compliments. And when I was the chair of the FTC, I did not have a picture of President Obama in my office, although many of my fellow independent agency chairs, independent agencies within the executive branch chairs did, I had a picture of William Humphrey because I also believed in the independence of independent agencies. So, I, oh. But I didn't give you that, but I, I, I would have given you one if you had asked me, but so you came to it yourself. I don't think it's right to pin me with confusion, John, because I didn't get to finish the sentence. <laughs> The reason I have the portrait of William Humphrey um, is because I never quite understood what quasi, sorry, that's William Humphrey of Humphrey's executor. Um, the firing protection that FTC commissioners enjoy uh, is cognizable under the Constitution because the agency is quasi-judicial and quasi-legislative. I still don't know what that means. I see little echoes of it in the statute, um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with what Justice Kagan said when she was describing the FTC and SALA law and said, well, those look like executive functions. Um, I think that's absolutely right. Well, 
So now I do see some, some daylight between us. So yeah, John, you said the FTC is an executive agency, but it's independent mm -hmm. agency within the executive branch. What does that mean? Well, I think what it means is, at least when I was at the agency, and I was at the agency as a non-chair commissioner and a commissioner, um, you tried very hard to keep politics away uh, from your decision making, and I think that's a wonderful, at least um, when, a, when a commission is functioning properly, an independent commission, um, I think it's a wonderful virtue of an independent commission, and I'll give you one example if I can. Um, so uh, one of the issues uh, that every commissioner, Democrat and Republican, agreed on um, was stopping a kind of behavior by brand pharmaceutical companies and generic pharmaceutical companies Brand pharmaceutical companies would essentially pay the generics to stay out of the market for a period of time. Um, and we called it pay for delay uh, pharmaceutical payments. And, um, and yet, the brands and the generics uh, were, and we finally won a case in the Supreme Court uh, uh, stopping the practice, um, or at least under a rule of reason uh, approach, stopping the practice 5 3, that was in Actavis. Um, but there is no doubt that uh, the generics uh, were very close to the Democrats, the brands were very close to Republicans, and also to uh, Democratic senators from, uh, various, uh, uh, from uh, various states around, let's say, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, uh, Delaware, where they were headquartered. And, um, and yet, w I think all of the commissioners, and it was win-win for these companies, right, and lose-lose for consumers, because brands have big high margins, generics have tiny margins, and the brand could pay the generic more not to compete, to sit it out than to compete. And yet, every commissioner, after, tr after thinking about this issue, because not all of us came to the agency with any knowledge about this, or much knowledge about it, uh, came to the conclusion that this was worth a fight. We lost in a couple of appeals courts. Um, and, um, and we designed a circuit split. Uh, we, we tried to create a circuit split to get a case to the Supreme Court. We ultimately did, and we won. And that saved consumers, all of us, um, billions and billions of dollars a year. Now, I'm not saying it wouldn't have happened if we were controlled by the executive branch, but I think it would have been, it could have been much more complicated. Do you have any, do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, do you think that, what does it mean to you to be independent, part of an independent agency? So what I hear in the, the colloquy already is a little bit of two different concepts. One is the concept of independence, and the other is the concept of not being political. And to some extent, the latter to me is fairly faithful to you know, the progressive design of the agency by President Wilson. There was a belief in expertise, that you could have a group of people who were really deep in the weeds of business conduct and they would be given special authority to study business conduct and they would fashion policy on their own, but critically, they would advise the Congress, which they did. They would even advise the courts and there's a provision in the FTC Act that permits that, although I don't know that it's ever been used. Um, so there's a notion of expertise as opposed to politics. I don't know how coherent that notion is, right? At the end of the day, um, even if we're dealing in things that a lot of people would agree as a matter of public policy ought to be technocratic, there are sort of inevitable political judgments that must be made, right? There are trade-offs. Um, we saw some of this in the discourse, I feel like, around COVID. Um, like, yes, there was a risk, but you were gonna shut down education, and that's a real thing we need to weigh, and maybe that's not a doctor's opinion. That's a social judgment someone is making. But the separate concept is the one of independence. And there, I think, you know, that's a different idea. There is this firing protection, um, at least as of today, April 25th, wherever we are, 2023, it still exists. Um, and so the FTC has some theoretical at least, room to move away from what the White House directs, because that is, it's the White House, the presidency, is the institution to which that independence is sort of directed. But I think as a practical matter, what we see is a lot of interplay between the agency and the executive. We also see um, the agency having a lot of interplay over time with Congress. Um, now, Congress is clearly not executive, but it certainly can have an impact on the independence of an agency. Um, and so I think it's important for us to sort of decouple those concepts and then take each of them as they are and analyze them. Okay, so I wanna ask you both about FTC rulemaking, but, but first I have a question. Um, how do you feel about OIRA review of FTC rules? 
I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> so I have no, if, if a legislative scheme were to send rulemakings to OIRA, I don't think I would have uh, any objection to it. Um, it would have to be by statute. It would have to not be by, by executive order, like uh, the rest yeah, of the so Yes, it would have to be by statute. It would have to be by statute, and the statute doesn't direct us to do that now. When we did rulemakings, um, you know, we always looked at a cost, costs and benefits. Um, I think under MAGMOS, uh, you have to do a cost benefit analysis uh, when you do a MAGMOS rule, and the FTC has multiple MAGMOS rulings. Um, that are ongoing um, now. That's the form of rulemaking at the FTC, for those who don't know it. It's different than APA rulemaking and um, uh, much more uh, uh, much more medieval form of rulemaking. It takes longer to do to do rules, so usually five, six years. Um, so I would not be, just, just, to, uh, uh, j just to come back to your question, um, I would not be averse to it. I know there's always a tension between, or I, I gather there is sometimes a tension between um, OIRA and independent agencies. Independent agencies are, you know, uh, 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 act like an independent agency, or should. Um, and, uh, but I don't, I don't, I think if there was a statutory designation, um, that, would be, uh, 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 that would be very workable. Yeah, I guess where I fundamentally start, uh, let's leave aside the institutional arrangement and the law, as a matter of policy, is it a good idea to have another set of eyes on proposed rules? And in particular, to help answer the question, you know, what are the potential costs of this rule? Inevitably, if the agency is proposing the rule, they support the policy. And so having a set of eyes that may not be married um, to pursuing whatever policy that is, um, take a look and assess the costs, I think is important. Even in the context of enforcement action, whether or not you really buy the distinction between the political and the expert, um, I do think it's very important for the agency always to get things right and to look very carefully and consider very carefully the arguments being made and the facts and circumstances. That applies a fortiori in the context of rulemaking because the impact of the thing is so much greater. And when I was a commissioner, one of the things I got very, um, well, one of the things that led me to dissent, uh, I suppose most prominently in one rulemaking matter, was I didn't feel like the agency had done sufficient homework in scoping the rule and thinking about the implications. And so having another set of eyes to me would be helpful. Is that a yes? That's a yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But can I just add one thing? The design of any commission is such, and, and not only commissions, but particularly commissions, is such that you have um, you have political appointees um, on top of bureaucrats. And so, and those political appointees, the independent agency, are from both parties, or at least only three can be from the president's party. And so you should have some degree of creative tension, I think, in any decision that an independent agency makes between the career staff um, and, the, uh, and the political appointees on top. So what about rulemaking? There's been, there's been a lot of talk recently about rulemaking efforts in the current FTC, and I'm wondering if um, the two of you would be interested to share your thoughts about that, to the extent to which maybe this rulemaking is a break from previous rulemakings and you know the legitimacy or authority for current rulemaking efforts. So Judge Rao mentioned earlier that the job that I had before I was a Federal Trade Commissioner was as a counsel to Senator Cornyn on the Judiciary Committee. And so that was sort of, that was a seven year period. And I spent a lot of time thinking about a lot of constitutional issues, but I think perhaps above them all, the separation of powers. So I vividly recall the first time someone presented me the concept, oh, sorry, let me back up. There is a constant back and forth on the Federal Trade Commission about what the phrase unfair methods of competition which section five of the statute allows the agency to enjoin, what that phrase means, and critically, whether and to what extent it exceeds the scope of the Sherman Act. Some people also say the Clayton Act, it's another discussion. So there's already a debate about what do the words mean, what kind of conduct the agency can condemn on a case-by-case -case basis. The moment I saw the concept that you could make a rule, a regulation, about an unfair method of competition, I immediately came back to those separation of powers issues um, with which I'd familiarize myself on the Judiciary Committee because it struck me that 
if people couldn't agree on what it meant, we had a delegation problem. And lo, you know, you go back to Schechter Poultry, and what is it that the NIRA, the National Industrial Recovery Act, gives the president the power um, to make rules about? It's, he, he gets the power to do codes of fair competition, which sounds a lot, you know, it's the linguistic obverse of unfair methods of competition. So that, it strikes me as a constitutional problem. But the other thing is this, to me, the case upon which this is all based, uh, you know, a Skelly Wright decision from your court, uh, from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. I, from I never sat with Skelly Wright. <laughs> <laughs> um, National Petroleum Refiners just doesn't hold up in terms of the way that we think about statutes and the way we think about rulemaking power today as a general matter. And I think in light of the major questions doctrine, again, sort of a fortiori, it really just doesn't look like the agency has the power. Let me just say that National Petroleum Refiners, though it is written by Skelly Wright, and though I think that in that decision, which is actually fairly brief, his opinion, um, he does say something along the lines of, well, it's not clear to me that the FTC has this rulemaking authority, but it clearly effectuates what we all believe to be the spirit of the FTC Act, and so therefore we are upholding it, but it was a unanimous decision. Um, uh, it, is, it is precedent, right? It is the, the closest thing we have to precedent. And by the way, th what they were fighting about then, which was a big fight and now is taken for granted, was the octane rule. It's the rule that requires uh, uh, gasoline stations to post the octane of, uh, uh, of the gasoline that we're all filling up with. So um, I think, I guess I would, par I, 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 I think it will, I don't want to pre, I don't want anyone to prejudge Judge Rao here, and thank you, I'm honored to be on this panel with you and of course with my friend Noah. Um, but I, 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 look, I, I do think that the, the FTC, because there is this precedent, um, and because particularly for low income workers, there is a very serious problem um, with non-competes, right? Maybe they're not enforceable, but if you're making $13 an hour at McDonald's and you wanna go earn $15 an hour at, at Burger King, um, you may not know that. And so I think they get a chance to take um, a shot down the field uh, at something uh, that is uh, arguably, and I believe is, uh, within their bailiwick, um, and that would be effectuating um, their mission. I guess the one thing I'd add to what I said before, the law on non-compete agreements is very old. It's well older than the Republic. This goes back to old English law and the relationship you know, between artisans and their apprentices. And it's always been a rule of reason. So forget the legal authority, forget the constitutional considerations, just brass tacks, antitrust law, They've drafted, not just in the context of low-wage workers, all workers, um, and workers broadly defined, and what non-compete clauses are broadly defined, they've drafted a per se rule for conduct that is very clearly not governed by that. In the draft rule, right? Not in the final rule. So you get to, you know, they get to modify whatever they do, and then it's subject to the courts. And I'll just say this. I, I, obviously, you're right about the history, Noah. But uh, it is also true that non-competes have become much more, uh, have become much broader, have become much more abused. And I'll just, I'll just give you one example that, that involves my family. I have a daughter, um, she works for a 12-person interior design company in Brooklyn. And when she was asked to sign her most recent contract, uh, uh, it had a 10-year non-compete, she's 25 years old, it had a 10-year non-compete with like no geographic boundaries whatsoever. Now, not everybody gets to call up someone who works on the Federal Trade Commission and say, Dad, is this enforceable? But, um, <laughs> but um, and so, I, you know, I, I, I hear you and reasonable people can disagree um, and, you know, we'll see where they come out and we'll see what happens. So I'll end on a point of agreement, which is I agree with you that we have apparently far too many non-compete agreements in this country. I agree that many of them appear to be unenforceable and many others appear also to be unjustified. Uh, so I think as a matter of public policy, that's a discussion we ought to have and you know, Congress is having that discussion. States are very actively having this discussion. The notice of proposed rulemaking goes through all of the recent legislation. Um, so there, 
I'm not unsympathetic on the policy, but I do think that doesn't answer the question of the legal authority. Well, and, and I don't disagree that sometimes, I mean, sometimes you can't bring an enforcement action when you're at the FTC, or you can't write a rule, and we did a fair amount of rulemaking. We don't, didn't consider our, ourselves a rulemaking agency. We consider ourselves more of an enforcement and policy agency because, actually, I believe sometimes it's appropriate for the legislature to do it, and it's not appropriate for, uh, for, an, for an agency, independent or otherwise, to, uh, to draft a rule. So I agree on that point as well, I think, but we're in sympathy. Or what, what about Noah's concerns about the non-delegation principle, or maybe more mildly, the major questions doctrine? Well, there's a major questions doctrine. It's been articulated by the Supreme Court. Um, it's going to be something that um, that the FTC is going to have to confront if it goes forward with its rule, and um, uh, uh, and, you know, we have a system where uh, it's going to be challenged in the courts, and the courts will have the ultimate, uh, will make the ultimate uh, 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 decision on that. So I think it's a, uh, uh, now some would say uh, that the major questions doctrine, non-delegation, is probably a recently, is a recently emerging doctrine. I'm no expert in this area. Uh, and, uh, uh, and really hadn't been front and center uh, uh, in jurisprudence until until fairly recently. Uh, but having said that, um, they have to confront it. They you know they can promulgate a rule, and again, sometimes you promulgate a rule and it gets thrown out, and uh, and that's the way our system works. And we should all be we should all be glad that you know rules that don't meet uh, judicial standards as a general matter um, aren't upheld. Okay. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the structure of the FTC right now. So, um, so there was so one commissioner, Christine Wilson, had a kind of noisy exit where she, where she resigned her post at the commission um, and raised some pretty serious allegations against the way the commission is currently operating. Um, the current makeup of the commission is three Democratic commissioners. There are no uh, minority Republican uh, commissioners on the at present. Um, so I'm wondering, what do you think about the, the noisy exit, uh, some of the charges that were leveled there, and, and also, um, how does it affect the legitimacy of the commission it, you know, to have vacancies of this, of this sort? Do you want me to? Sure. Okay. Um, so it's unfortunate. I, you know, I, I know Christine Wilson. I like her a lot. I know Lena Khan, and I have enormous respect for her. Um, it's, it's bad for the stature of the agency. Um, uh, when you have a, uh, let's just call it a fiery exit like that on the, you know, on the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, uh, I think the commission... She said it was noisy, not fiery. She, she, oh, I know, I characterize no. it as fiery. <laughs> In fact, she knocked over the pitcher of water. Right, so that's, yeah. Um, but, um, uh, and, you know, my view, and it may be antiquated, uh, was that, uh, or quaint, um, was that the commission? This is another reason why I, I, I really like the stature, the, the 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 independent agency structure, is because the commission functions better when everyone is sitting around and trying to solve a problem, uh, and uh, uh, and you try to come to a consensus. Now, this was probably not your experience on your commission, but it was certainly the experience on the commissions I served on, um, and uh, uh, and so. Um, uh, I, you know, I hope they add uh, uh, new commissioners sooner rather than later. Um, and, and, I, and I'll just say one other one other point on this. So take, for example, a lot of your antitrust lawyers, you know that they're promulgating uh, new merger guidelines. Um, and uh, one of the things we tried to do when we did the last round of merger guidelines in 2009 and 2010 was we tried to make sure uh, that we had a consensus. We had a consensus on the commissioners. We had some degree of consensus uh, around stakeholder interest, stakeholders. Um, but if you if you end up uh, uh, writing, uh, uh, and we did that for a very, and we thought we pushed very hard um, in many ways to make um, uh, to make certain types of mergers involving nascent competitors and uh, certain types of and other uh, things like direct evidence um, uh, more a part of merger reviews. But we were very, we wanted to make sure we had a consensus because the most important thing about the merger guidelines 
um, was that they get adopted by the courts, and they very quickly got adopted by the courts. So I think if you're uh, a three-person Democratic FTC and you are proposing guidance on mergers, you want to be very careful uh, that you still try to strive for consensus because there's not really much value in, um, uh, in uh, promulgating merger guidelines that won't be adopted by the courts. So, so a lot baked in there. I guess I'd start with this. When I was in the commission majority, we had some very loud dissents. And those dissents drew a lot of attention negative on the agency. And if you're the object of those dissents on some level, that's a hard thing to deal with. And if you're a chair trying to run an agency, that's even harder. Um, it's not easy to herd cats. It's especially hard to herd like Senate confirmed cats. Um, <laughs> It's true. Independent cats. In, indep unfireable, <laughs> unaccountable, all the things, cats. Um, what Nate did not mention is there's a musical number at the end. And so that's, that's where we're going here with it. Are you going to dance? I only sing. Okay. No, no dance. Costumes are right back over here. <laughs> so. You know, then when I found myself in the commission minority, I saw some things I didn't like um, and would call those out. And it's very clear um, from the paper record for the public that com the, the number of things that were concerning Commissioner Wilson increased over time, probably almost certainly culminating in her dissent in the, in the meta within uh, recusal matter. There is, however, a benefit hard as it is to run an agency, I think to the public. Um, and also, I want to overstate this, but to the courts, who are sometimes looking at matters as they come up. And I was once a dissenting commissioner in a matter that ended up in court against a Republican chair. There is a benefit to the ability of someone noisily to exit. And you can't rely, and people shouldn't have to rely, on career civil servants to try to make the kind of noise in ways that may not be appropriate. Um, one of the benefits that the commission structure gets you is where things are wrong, and yeah, it's subject to which people you have, there is at least an opportunity for that to get out. Um, and I think that can invite a positive sort of scrutiny. Again, I was the object of some of this. It wasn't always easy, but I think, you know, kind of glad it's there. But, but dissenting is different from exiting. Once you've exited, you can no longer dissent. Correct. So, what do you, I mean, what do you think about the, you know, should you stay and dissent? Should you? <laughs> this is obviously um, something I struggle with. The decision whether you know, to stay in a job and leave depends on a lot of different things. Some of those are personal things. Some of those are professional things. You know, I would say personally, I very much enjoyed the occasional florid dissent. Um, I was less interested in rat-a-tat, lots of little things, um, because you want to produce good work product. And to my mind, you want to save um, the really loud dissents for the things that kind of matter most. Say so this, the dissents should generally be because you disagree with um, you disagree with outcomes, and you want to put that on the record. And I dissented plenty of times. Um, and I'm not saying, and, and, and I, I think in the most recent departure of Commissioner Wilson, it was, it was both, uh, it, was both a, it was both a substantive disagreement, and it was also, I'm very unhappy with the way the commission is being run, right? So I think to your, to your question, um, uh, you can't dissent when you're gone, right? But, but of course, people get to decide when they're leaving. Um, and, uh, uh, and also, you, you, there are different ways to dissent and be heard. Just roughly, what percentage of FTC decisions have a dissent? Do you have a sense of that? What percentage draw dissent? I guess it's fairly low. Low, yeah. Because most of the work on which the commission is voting, on average over time, is like enforcement matters. And most of those enforcement matters are probably not that controversial. It, my guess is if you did the statistical work, you would see a trend toward more over time because I think the commission is less interested in what used to be garden variety work and more interested in kind of edge stuff and edge tends to raise controversy. There's also a lot more rulemaking and stuff like that. Um, but my guess is the numbers are still pretty weighted in 
favor of. Uh, I think that's right. And there also is a practice, uh, uh, going back to when I was chair and before, that sometimes, you know, there would be a, dis there would be a reasonable people, there would be a close matter where reasonable people could disagree and there would be some internal discussion and you would find yourself in the minority and then um, you would just vote for five, you would vote for uh, uh, the consensus decision because you wanted to show a consensus on a particular matter. So I don't think that happens anymore, does it? No, I think it still happens, but it probably it. less. Um, so let me ask you a, another structural question. So, so one of the things I learned from my government service, talking to many independent agency, um, independent agency heads or chairmen, is that in practice a lot of independent agencies can operate like a single-headed executive agency because the chair controls the balance of power. Um, in most independent agencies, they have significant control over staffing and agenda setting and things like this. And so I'm wondering, how much does the bipartisanship of these multi-member commissions really, does it matter? Does it make a difference where the chair you know, controls the balance of power and, and the agenda in most cases? So I think where I would start in answering that question is it really depends a lot on the chair and the people. Like this is as much a personality driven thing and the views of the individuals driven thing because there's no guarantee that the chair controls the members of their party. That's a decision that those commissioners are going to make whether to follow the chair. John, you had a lot of fun. <laughs> So, so I would say, look, the, the chair controls most of the agenda, uh, uh, the vast majority of the agenda. Um, but I think, uh, uh, from from my perspective, at least in the commissions I served in, um, you know, we were always sort of talking about ideas. And when I um, became chair, um, I went and I talked to all my colleagues, all of whom I liked and trusted, and we sort of worked through sort of a consensus proactive agenda. One thing was on um, uh, uh, stopping uh, uh, a reverse payment settlement, but pay for delay pharmaceutical settlements. Another issue was doing more on in the privacy area. We had a few others. Um, and then we had vigorous, you know, disagreements sometimes on, on matters, but, um, but uh, and by the way, you know, I'm thinking about this. No one from OIRA ever invited me in to go talk to them, or no one ever wanted to come over. Maybe Cass Sunstein came over once. I would have and invited gave a talk. you over. What? I invited them all over. What? I'm sorry. What? I said I invited them all over. Well, you, yeah. you were a really good head of OIRA, and that's a really <laughs> smart thing to do. Um, anyway, um, so I think it does depend a lot on the chair. Although I do think that the the, the chair. Uh, often speaks for the commission, on, certainly on consensus issues, and the chair sort of runs the agency as a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Did, did you often have your same party commissioners breaking ranks with what you wanted to yeah. pursue? Well, um, it's an interesting question. So uh, when I first became, uh, so when I was on the commission for my first four and a half years, I was the only Democrat. There's a Democrat and independent and either two or three Republicans. Uh, uh, when I became chair, I was the only Democrat with an independent and two Republicans. Um, when we had a full commission, uh, uh, I had a cons we, we had a, con a Democrat who was more conservative on antitrust issues, um, certainly than I was, and then the other Democratic commissioner, and a Republican um, who was more aggressive on antitrust issues uh, than one of the Democrats. So the answer is, from time to time, it happened. So, um, so what about transparency with a multi-member agency? There have been various allegations, um, in part in the noisy, noisy exit of Commissioner Wilson, about lack of transparency. And I'm wondering, is transparency different for an independent agency like the FTC as opposed to you know, an executive branch agency? Um, I know there are various laws like Sunshine Laws that apply um, to multi-member commissions. But, but, you know, transparency is something that we often talk about is really important in the regulatory space. So I haven't spent really any time in that part of the executive branch that understands itself properly as the executive branch. So I can't speak to the comparison. What I will say is this. When you have a multi-member commission, each of the members of that commission, in theory, are superordinate to the whole staff. And so they can get in theory, information about what is going on. 
And there ends up being kind of a back and forth where especially if a member is concerned that something might be amiss or they're interested in a matter that they're gonna have a problem with when it comes up to the commission, um, there is an exercise you know, between the staff and the commissioner and the chair's office about you know, what kind of information is delivered when. And so it's not a transparency vis-a-vis -vis the public or the press. Um, Congress is a little bit different a little bit differently situated, but even within the commission, there are sort of real transparency issues um, that pop up a lot. We had fewer of those issues, I would say, in internal uh, commission transparency issues because Bill Kovacic, who was my immediate predecessor, um, wanted to make sure that every commissioner had a chance to see whatever was going on, and I thought that was a really good approach, and so we continued it, right? So you, you, you know, so, uh, and, and not every and, 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 and not every commissioner or not every chair has done that uh, over history going back and looking. Yeah, so, so this changed pretty early. Um, after Chair Khan came on, one of the first things that the new majority did was they um, adopted a bunch of resolutions that essentially divested the commission of power to initiate antitrust investigations. It used to be the commission would vote um, to initiate investigations, and so everyone could have a chance to see what was going on. And in the name of efficiency, they took that power away from the commission, um, and that was a reduction in transparency. And you saw Commissioner Wilson and myself in, in, sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although, as a practical matter, I don't know that it made much of a difference, right? We never had a problem when I was at the commission as a non-chair commissioner or commissioner getting processed to 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 move forward on a matter. Right, and I don't think anyone really resisted no, the no. process. No, no, I've never seen an example of where process was a real issue. I mean, it was an opportunity to ask questions and say, is this really going to be a case? Are we wasting our time? Whatever. Um, okay, I have a few more questions, but then we're gonna open it up to the audience, so there's a, a microphone if, if any of you have questions for our, for our panel. But, um, so, so one of the things we were chatting about a little bit before, uh, before we came on stage you know, is, is um, what happens if Humphrey's executor is overruled? I know you both have a, have a Humphrey's uh, picture in your office. Maybe, maybe I should get one too. But, um, you know, it's, I, um, you know, after seal of law in Collins, you know, what, is, what do you think may happen with Humphrey's? And, and if Humphrey's were to be overruled by the Supreme Court, um, what would the consequences of that be for the FTC? I don't know that the consequences are that huge, right? SELA has obviously impacted the course of the CFPB, but there are plenty of agencies in the executive branch that don't have formal independence in the sense that the FTC and some other agencies similarly located enjoy, but kind of norms and pressure effectively protect agency heads from firing unless things are really bad. You know, you think of like the FBI or the Department of Justice. The president has complete authority to fire the heads of those agencies, but there's a cost, right? And it doesn't mean the president isn't always willing to bear or isn't often willing to bear the cost, but there is a cost. And I just don't know if you introduced, if you sort of invalidated that part of the statute, would it really change that much? My guess is actually no. It, it might be right. It, it may not change in terms of actual firings, but what about presidential control? Well, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting question. I, 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 agree, mo I agree partly with you. I, I, I concur in part and I dissent in part. Um, the, uh, yeah, that was a feeble attempt at a joke, but if you're not going to laugh, that's my last joke of the day. Um, you, got some, you got some laughs, John. <laughs> so, so uh, look, I, I, I would say that if Humphrey's executive, well, first of all, I should say, and I want to say that it's you know if you go back and you read Humphrey's executor, a unanimous, uh, a unanimous opinion uh, written by I think Justice Sutherland, um, it, it's it's a you know he points out that um, the FTC is not exactly like other branches of the uh, uh, other parts of the executive of, of of the executive branch, right? The FTC sits as a court, for example on matters before it uh, in its administrative proceedings. Um, and, and so I, I guess I think that in normal times, uh, if Humphrey's executor is overturned, 
it, it won't be a it, it it won't be a disaster, and it may not even be a sea change. But I think it does change, to some extent, uh, the uh, the character of an independent agency, and and that's a character that you probably heard me say I really like because I do think that independence allows you to get out from under political decision making, not that it's always political decision making in the executive branch or Congress, but it allows you to do the thing you think is right, um, uh, regardless of what, you know, what, what the politicians who appointed you or nominated you believe, and I think that's generally a good thing. And I do believe, let's just make two more points quickly, I, I, I do believe that in the back of some commissioners' minds, it would not be unreasonable to think, well, if the president wants me to do this and I do that, you know, is it going to, is it going to cost me in some way? And, um, and by having a truly independent agency, I, I, I think that's, uh, that is, a, that is less, uh, a, a less likely outcome. Um, uh, and, uh, and so, and I guess one other point, um, well, let me stop there. So, so President Biden issued an executive order on antitrust in which he used the word encourage for various policies taken by the FTC. He said, you know, we encourage mm -hmm. the FTC to do, you know, various things, take various policy positions. So, so what does that look like? So, you know, if it was, say, um, you know, the Agriculture Department, the president could just issue an order saying, Agriculture Department shall pursue this policy. So is there a difference between encouraging and directing? So, so I think there is, and I think that's why we have these words. And I vaguely recall from the, the July 2021 executive order, for the rulemakings, there's like a different verb used for the non-compete, um, and then, one of the or words. shall enthusiastically, with all deliberate speed, consider, yeah, that. Um, <laughs> But I think it comes back to the flip of the question, Judge, that you asked before, which is, no, no, but at the end of the day, like, you can't be fired. Even if you enjoy independence under the statute, saying no to the President of the United States, whatever your statutory scheme, is not a little thing. But does the President call the chairman of the FTC and suggest policies, uh. encourage? consider policies? <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know if you want to speak uh, to that, but you were the chairman. You know, I, so. I had to stop taking yeah. President Obama's calls after yeah. a while because it was yeah. just, they were so incessant, you know, <laughs> what we should do. Um, he, just, he just wanted a rematch on basketball, yeah. John. That's what he wanted. Um, no, it, it, we, we, it, we had a, you know, I mean, look, I, I certainly had a sense of what the administration was thinking because I paid attention to what they were thinking and I have friends who worked in the administration. In, in the executive branch of the executive branch. Um, uh, but, um, no, I didn't mean that disparagingly. disparagingly. Um, the, uh, 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 but uh, no, I think actually m m the only handful of times I can, I can think about a president, and when I was there it was President Bush and President Obama, um, uh, uh, b b discussing policy issues. I think was when we maybe went over and tried to encourage them to put something on, say, pharmaceutical competition into their budget. Um, uh, and, and, and there was a large breach at um, the VA in maybe 2006 or seven, and the president wanted us to do an investigation, it wasn't quite within our jurisdiction, um, and uh, uh, called up the chair. And uh, uh, the chair asked us what we thought, and we all thought that was a good idea, so we did it. But um, it's, it's a little bit different now. I, I, I think they were careful in that executive order not to, n not to direct, because I think they recognize the distance between, an between different types of agencies, not to direct the commission to do it, but they coordinate much more now. I, I, don't, I, I haven't quite gotten my arms around that. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a new development. Hey, um, why don't we take a, a question from the audience? Thank you so much, but the gentleman over there was first, so if his president is currently oh, sorry, in office, he gets to go. Sorry, sorry. Hi, uh, my name's Devin Watkins. Uh, I question whether the FTC's removal protections are still good precedent. 
In SELA law, uh, the Supreme Court said, instead of making reports and recommendations to Congress, as the 1935 FDC did, the director possesses the authority to probably make binding rules. And that was one of the reasons they gave for eliminating the protection for removal. Um, given that we all agree today that the FTC of today has that binding rulemaking authority that didn't exist in 1935, why isn't under current precedent that protection unlawful? Well, look, I think this is an argument being raised today in front of the commission, in front of federal courts. I think my allusion earlier to what Justice Kagan writes in SALA law is, is about that issue precisely. Um, but the state of play right now at least as a matter of Supreme Court precedent, is you've got Free Enterprise Fund, and you've got Salem Law, and you've got Collins, and each time the court has sort of walked up to Humphrey's yeah. executor um, and not yet upset the precedent. Well, so, you know, I think it, it's a fair question to raise, and we're gonna see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll, I, I agree absolutely with you, and I, I think Justice Roberts, who I believe wrote the Celia Law opinion, is very careful about both distinguishing the FTC from the CFPB as a multi-member commission, and then also says things like, but is it really the commission that it was in 1935? So I, I think we're all gonna be watching to see, uh, to see where the court comes out. And, you know, uh, Axelon was sort of the kind of amuse bouche for, uh, for Humphrey's, for, for a revisiting of Humphrey's executor, and I, my guess is that's gonna happen in the next several terms. I'd be sort of surprised if it doesn't, so we'll have to see. To ask for an elaboration uh, from a couple of small things from the beginning of the discussion. Do you think it's possible in a bipartisan way, putting cynicism aside, to come up with a clear um, sort of cohesive definition of where politics ends and where policy or, or scientific government or scientific decision making, which is sort of the way that these agencies, I think, were designed to work in the earlier part of the 20th century. Is that really possible today? And, and how would you two really um, define that, putting party affiliation aside? Um, and the second point um, is to what, to what extent do you think the, the situation is sort of frozen in time with the concept of government from the 1910s, 20s, and 30s which may be developed with all good intentions, um, how do you think American society will overhaul these institutions which have been with us for almost 100 years um, in some cases and were sort of unprecedented when they started out? When will sort of the next revolution in government happen? And is it realistic to expect that from the courts or would it require Congress to do something if that's possible in a major way to change the way the system works? Um, how, how would you see that happening if the current system really is outdated, as, as many people believe it is, or was founded in, in assumptions about how government would work that haven't played out? So a lot there, two different questions. Let me sort of try to tackle the first one and hope I remember the second one when I'm done. The, what I would say is this, at least in my mind, there are probably some issues where you could build consensus around the notion that the thing being determined really is a matter of expertise. I don't know why my mind goes to this, but like drug approval or, you know, how, I don't know. Okay, bad example, right? <laughs> Richard Pierce, keeping us honest every day. Um, how to allocate spectrum. Uh, or maybe that's even a bad example, like how the particulars of spectrum okay, no, allocate. Find one, find one example. I'm trying. Um, I like to think there are some areas, but it doesn't take a lot of time or even a lot of my talking to get you into a position where people very clearly can spot where value judgments are creeping in. I mean, I don't mean that pejoratively, like we have to make value judgments in governing, writ large. Congress makes them, prosecutors make them, everybody makes them. And so finding where that line really is, is, I think, inevitably going to be hard. I don't know that it lays along partisan lines, although maybe folks on the right tend to see more things as laden with value judgment. Folks on the left tend to see more things as matters of expertise. You know, like, I don't know, you know where the minimum wage ought to be or, or, or whatever your issue. Um, but I, I think it's a very, very hard line to draw. So I think, oh, sorry, let me finish. I think the next question was about, you know, sort of when's the next revolution in government 
and the agency's not operating as maybe people envision them. I, that's way above my pay grade, but what I will say is this, the tension I see isn't between how the agencies, independent agencies were conceived and how they're operating. The tension to my mind is they were conceived with a view in particular of the separation of powers and the Constitution at a time when the, uh, that view of the separation of powers and the Constitution isn't you know, I, I, where I see things moving. And I kind of see things moving in a return to where they originally were. Um, it's not a response to sort of how the agencies are behaving. It's more a response to the structuring of the agencies. And this, by the way, it leads to me to an important point. I do hear a lot of people say things like, oh, you know, the commission is overreaching and so the constitutional response is gonna be this. To my mind, the constitutional response shouldn't be to like a policy disagreement or the agency overreaching. It's, is the structure inherently problematic from a constitutional perspective? And that, to my mind, that's the big tension that all of these agencies are facing. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, and, 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 but I also think it is true and, uh, that, that, that when you take a different job, a job at an independent agency, whether it's the SEC, the FCC, the FTC, um, uh, uh, you have a different function and you're supposed to behave that way. So Noah and I worked on the Judiciary Committee where we were involved in policy and politics, right? And we went over to the FTC and we tried to put politics aside. I'm not saying we were like, Thomas a. Beckett, but we, we, we tried to distance ourselves from that because we had different obligations. And, um, and so, uh, you know, we live in a 24-7 news cycle. We have people who much more today get um, uh, their information from channels that reinforce their pre-existing views um, rather than sort of objective, more objective sources. Um, uh, but, 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 but so you, you, you have to kind of there's no doubt that there's there's a political. Uh, it, it, the FTC is not supposed to be a political agency, but it l lives within the swirl of politics to some extent, and um, you have to be aware of that. But you have to try to distinguish what you're doing now from those other uh, factors in the uh, in the atmosphere, and and then I don't. I, I mean, I guess I guess uh, um, again agreeing with Noah. I don't think that the independent agency system is broken. I mean, I, I actually think it, 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 it works pretty well for doing the business uh, that uh, uh, it's supposed to uh, under its statute. And when, when commissions uh, go too far, as some white might have said commissions have, did in, the, let's say, the 1980s, um, you know, they are very often um, chastened by the courts. And so, uh, uh, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to, it would have to be Congress, of course, or I suppose the court in some way, but I, I think it would have to be Congress uh, that changes the structure, but I don't think that structure's failed. And again, one thing you get on the FTC um, is uh, a built-in dissent. You know, for those of you in the audience who are antitrust lawyers and uh, you try to, you know, to, you, try, you think about the Tunney Act, right? I don't think there's ever been a single example of where a judge has reversed a settlement at the Justice Department uh, under the Tunney Act. Um, on the other hand, minority positions on the FTC, uh, whether they're Democratic minorities or Republican minorities, um, it gives you some leverage in, in negotiating an outcome uh, or a procedure or a pathway forward. And it, um, and it also gives you a very clear voice of dissent. We've just seen that very recently in a very, uh, in a very clear way. Yes, sorry. I guess I just wanted to follow up on a preceding question and bring the conversation back, I suppose, where it started on the reverse payment uh, settlements between pharma companies. And in the interest of full disclosure, I have wrote an articles and filed briefs against the FTC on this issue, so those were fighting words for me, but I don't want to relitigate the issue itself. I guess the question is, why is it necessarily good to take the politics out of that question? As of course you know, the earlier version of that litigation had Department of Justice and FTC on opposite sides, right? So you had some very smart lawyers and economists on one side, some very smart lawyers and economists on the other side, and at least some of them thought that there's some consumer benefit in these settlements. Maybe because drug companies ultimately get more money and develop more, whatever, you don't have to agree with it. The point is that that was the view. 
And if that's the view, why is it inappropriate for political process to work out as to like, what do we weigh more? Do we weigh more that or that? I mean, I just, it seems a bit odd to say that well, we can get a professional judgment on this. All right, maybe I'll take this. So um, it's, it's not, you know, the political process could have very much resolved this problem. And as you may recall, we had sort of a two-prong strategy at the FTC. One prong was to create a circuit split and get a case to the Supreme Court because we thought they would come out in a pretty good place and they came out in a pretty good place. Uh, and the other prong was to try to get um, uh, Congress uh, to pass a law that would make these deals presumptively illegal. We got that through the House. Um, we got it into the Affordable Care Act Conference Committee. And then, uh, for those of you who love obscure footnotes, um, uh, uh, Senator Kennedy passed away. They lost uh, uh, a 60 vote. Uh, they lost a, 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 um, uh, a they didn't have 60 votes, so they couldn't close the debate under cloture. And the House took the Senate, the, the House took the Senate version of the pay for delayed legislation, so it never got passed because it wasn't in the Senate version. So the political process was involved. I don't have a problem with that. You know, if we had lost, I would have been unhappy. But um, uh, if we, had, if they had said these deals are absolutely legal, but that would have been the end of the the end of the outcome. So, so just to be clear, yeah. it's pretty clear to me, at least that Congress has delegated authority both to the Department of Justice and the FTC to enforce the antitrust laws. And like, yes, some of the decisions about the kind of business conduct um, against which they might enforce may be laden with values and whatever, but prosecutors do have to make decisions about the law. And that's pretty much true for all prosecutors. I, on some level, like some decisions matter a lot, but. That's part of just the way law works. So I, to me, I don't see that as like, m maybe you disagree on the policy question, but it, 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 it's fairly well within the scope of antitrust consideration. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. This has been very interesting. Are there any downsides to delegating rulemaking authority to these independent agencies? And if there are, is there anything more that can be done to protect individuals? I think the big downside is a democratic deficit, right? Um, when you get to a point where there's really no limit on the decisions being made, and they're really being made by people who are not accountable, right, to the public <laughs> in the way that Congress is, or members of Congress are, um, I think that's the major problem. Uh, it also creates a, you know, it, it's an odd fit within our, our tripartite tripartite scheme of government. In terms of what can be done, um, Congress can be clear in what it writes, right? Um, and to some extent, the pressure the courts will apply if they're policing, the major, whether it's the major questions doctrine or the non-delegation doctrine, will force Congress into the position. You wanna give them authority to write rules? Be clear about what that authority is. Then these problems don't arise. Um, that's sort of how I think about it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And, um, and again, we now have a, a, a judiciary writ large um, that is very skeptical of, um, of rulemakings by, uh, uh, of, rule, of rulemakings generally by, from the executive branch. And so I, I think we'll have to see how that plays out. But in recent years, it has played out I would say not particularly well for some of the most uh, edgy, controversial rulemakings. And I guess I would say, aside from the sort of democratic deficit issues, I think the other the other big problem is sometimes agencies don't get it right. I think more often they do than they don't. Um, but sometimes, um, even if it's not arbitrary and capricious, it's the wrong outcome. So I, I you know, I, I think yes, Congress could make this clearer. No, they won't make it clearer because uh, it's just not in their it's not in their DNA to do that kind of thing easily, it's a very difficult thing for them to do? So, you, uh, I'm, yes and no, right? <laughs> People have other constitutional issues with the law I'm about to mention, but recently, right, the Congress passes the Horse Racing um, Integrity and Safety Act, which gives the FTC all sorts of weird powers. But like, that's Congress pretty specifically writing to a topic. Now there's a whole other discussion to be had about that particular law. I think Congress can still do this, they just have to want to. They do it in tax. They do it in tax? Pretty frequently. Yeah. Yes, they can, they, yes. But like, for example, um, I think Congress wanted, when it created the FTC, to create a 
uh, an agency that had much more limited um, uh, uh, sanctions and much broader jurisdiction. That's why they said unfair methods of competition, right? Uh, they wanted it to have broader jurisdiction uh, than um, uh, than uh, the Justice Department, uh, and they don't put people in jail, and so uh, uh, so so limited, uh, so very limited sanctions, um, and I, that I think was by design. And I, you know, if if, if if I'm not saying you're suggesting this, but if you wanted to pare back the uh, the uh, jurisdiction of the FTC, that th that I think sh is unlikely to happen um, uh, by Congress, and I, I certainly don't think it should happen. Yeah. Question in the back. In my research, I've been uh, coming across some rare reports on intolerance in the World Economic Forum for dissenting views. Um, uh, do either of you or do you know of any others that are giving consideration to the impact of stakeholder capitalism and the World Economic Forum on the work um, and responsibilities of uh, the agency with which you have been um, involved. I mean, I think, I, I can't speak to the, the particulars of, of, of the World Economic Forum. Generally, the agencies invite a lot of stakeholder input and the story of you know, which inputs get credited um, and how the agency proceeds in light of the input it, that it gets is you know, the object of a lot of writing in administrative law. Uh, agree. Uh, so I have a question about vacancies. So many federal independent commissions and boards have gone significant periods with vacancies. As you mentioned, there are currently vacancies from the Republican side on the FTC. And one instance that comes to mind for me is the Merit Systems Protection Board, which from 2017 to 2022 lacked a quorum. One of the reasons for that was because of one senator who disagreed with the constitutionality of the MSPB and therefore sought to hold up any nominees from moving forward. My question for you is whether or not you believe a senator who disagrees with the constitutionality of a specific board or commission holding up the filling of vacancies is a one, legitimate under the separation of powers, and two, reasonable way of expressing that concern about the constitutionality of the board or commission. Well, I would say without knowing the particular circumstances of who was holding it up and, and why, I think it's a good idea to have a quorum in these agencies, even if you believe um, that they are constitutional, uh, because um, uh, because these agencies have functions and people are before them and their real lives are impacted. And so, you know, my my sense is you want to let agencies, you want to make sure that agencies have quorums. I'd also say that this is partly an issue of both Noah and I worked in the Senate, of Senate procedure, you know, sometimes you don't even have to surface if you are the one person putting a hold on something. And, um, and, and, and they may, you know, at some point, they may think about ways to, and of course they are, uh, think about ways they may wanna make their procedure a little more effective. Um, but to your underlying question, I think it's a bad thing for agencies not to have quorums, even if you disagree with, you know, what they're supposed to be, uh, uh, even if you disagree with their constitutionality. I definitely agree with that. Well, and after Axon, you can now bring your constitutional challenge directly to court. <laughs> so. Say what? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I think that the way Republicans um, respond to this is the big elephant in the room, pardon the pun. Um, do you see Republicans, you know, you both were in the Senate, and you have experience there. Do you see Republicans going back to the consensus that existed for 40 years, or do you see Republicans accepting this idea that antitrust law can resolve social issues, and Republicans just happen to have other ideas about what those social issues are, um, and you know, adopting this enforcement galore? I mean, I think, I, I think it's fairly clear that especially in the last few years, 
the voices uh, within the Republican Party for you know, enforcement galore, pursuing social issues, what have you, through antitrust are growing. Whether they have, and, and they found right, incredible allies on the left who absolutely want to do those things. Whether that lasts, how it manifests, I don't know. Um, it's not a view that I share. Um, and it was very interesting to be on the commission at a time where that existed. I, I did, one thing I used to say to members of Congress, I won't out anyone in particular, was, you know, big tech is a gateway drug. And I do think people need to be a lot more clear about when they sign up for what sounds like a politically appealing idea, or maybe a tweet that sounds good, um, what the long-term implications of that policy concession are. Because I think they are real. I think they will work um, bad things for antitrust law, but critically, above all, um, bad things for consumers. Uh, we've seen a lot of normalization. Um, I'll pick on one bill in Congress. Uh, of the idea that cartels are okay if they're people I like. Right? So there's a bill right now to protect the news organizations and, and allow them to cartelize. Whatever you think about the merits of that idea, it's definitely not pro-competition, right? The whole idea is to displace competition. And Commissioner Bedoya got up and gave a speech recently where he was like, we shouldn't go after you know, the honest good laborer when they want to cartelize because John Sherman said something. Um, <laughs> And again, like I tend to be a pro-competition person. Those are not competition ideas. They're distribution of rent ideas, but they also hurt people. Like if you make things more expensive, people pay more. And in particular, they hurt the poor. And I think we need to keep that in mind. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I am not thinking within the core of Republican circles, but watching all of this, um, uh, from the outside, I'd also say that you sometimes have to distinguish the rhetoric, which is very, very heated, from the actual action here. And uh, the, the, it is meaningful, at least as I, as I think about it, uh, that last Congress, uh, when there were uh, Democratic majorities on both sides, Congress did not pass uh, antitrust, uh, uh, and I support a lot of that antitrust legislation, but Congress didn't pass it. And so, I, 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 I kind of wonder whether, I, I kind of question whether the rhetoric, uh, particularly on the Republican side, um, over very, I think, legitimate concerns, will ground itself or come to ground in antitrust legislation. I'm kind of skeptical that it will. The mental exercise in which I like to engage is scrap antitrust, just put in securities or tort. Like we don't think of body, these bodies of law, like you could use them as a cudgel, right? You can direct political leadership to go after people you don't like. But it's like a, from South Park, like the underpants gnomes problem. Like you know that they get the underpants and then they make profits, but you're not sure how. There's a lot of like, if we had more of this, we would get more of that. And I'm just not seeing the middle in a lot of these cases. I think that analogy was unfamiliar to many of us. <laughs> It's a very important <laughs> <laughs> cultural <laughs> referent. <laughs> Sorry, um, question over here. <laughs> well, first, I never heard of enforcement galore. It sounds like a Bond vision, villain. But um, I, my, my question is: uh, the FTC's um, has an, has well been accused recently of working with the Europeans to do things that I can't do in America. But even before this current commission. Um, when the FTC went after Qualcomm, for instance, the other FTCs in other countries go after the American company. They sort of seem to take uh, th their leads from the American FTC. And, um, and this had some devastating effects. And then when the FTC lost, a lot of those cases went away um, in Korea, I think, in Japan, certain other things. I think they had effect what had happened here. And so my question is, what should the role of the FTC be with American companies um, and its outlook with all these other, what I'll call copycat FTCs in other countries? Well, well, it's a, it's, it's a really good question. I mean, my view, well, first of all, whenever you have a merger, and often when you have parallel conduct cases, no matter where they started, um, uh, it, it's appropriate for the agencies to share information, talk to each other, 
often the target, and sometimes the target even in a conduct case, allows the exchange of confidential information. So I think that's a good thing. I also think that the leadership of, and I've read a lot of stuff about Qualcomm. Um, uh, at one point I did a little bit of work for Qualcomm, but not on the particular matter you're talking about. Um, so I just wanted to disclose that. Uh, uh, but it, it's, it is also appropriate for the FTC and the antitrust division to show international leadership on antitrust issues. And, and so I guess it sort of comes down to are they exercising good judgment, right? And that's the most important thing from, from my perspective. Now, there have been some stories about certain instances in which the FTC was, or the FTC was lobbying another, another agency. I haven't, I, I don't, I, I certainly read about that. And I, you know, I would certainly, that, that gets you kind of close to, that, that, that gets you in a circumstance where it's, a, if it's accurate, where there are legitimate questions being raised. But I do, I just do wanna say, one is appropriate to share information with, uh, with your foreign counterparts, and two is we all want, believe me, we all want the FTC and the antitrust division to be leaders in uh, the world antitrust community. Um, uh, it, otherwise, particularly for American corporations, life would be far, far more difficult, I think. So I was both on the commission where both of the cases that you mentioned and alluded to were going on, and I'm now at a law firm that is representing the defendants of each, so. <laughs> I'm largely gonna take a pass. What I will say is this, John is correct, um, especially where you have international you know, cross-border mergers or you have conduct that reaches um, across uh, state lines, state in the international sense of the word. Um, it is inevitable that lots of enforcers are going to be involved and there are protocols, there are rules and there are laws about how they share information about things and that can be good, but it is also critical that U.S. law enforcers, um, their job is to enforce U.S. law, um, and keeping that top of mind in any context is critical. Thank you. I think, uh, I think we're out of time now. So can you all please join me in uh, thanking our panel?